Good evening and welcome to the fourth episode of Vanguard, Conversations with Women of Color in STEM. I'm your host, Jedida Eisler, and with me is an incredible set of women that I am super excited to introduce you to uh, and have you get to know over the course of the next hour. The conversation starts with something that one of our very faithful viewers did, which is watch, and I guess it's not really related to watching things, um, but she's one of our viewers. She watches all the time, and so we really wanted to highlight something that she had done that gotten a lot of attention. It's the failing in STEM hashtag on Twitter. So before I get into you know, what that is, let me introduce you to our speakers. Our first speaker and panelist is uh, Nicole Cabrera Salazar. She is a Georgia State University graduate student, actually a dissertating graduate student. She'll be finished ever so shortly. Um, she works on exoplanets and those that transit around stars. She's also what we like to call a fire starter. She's created several organizations at her institution, including in Inclusive STEM and the Georgia State, oh, sorry, and AstroPal. So she's a social justice advocate and a really strong supporter of both astrophysics and inclusion in astrophysics itself. So thank you, Nicole, and welcome. Thank you. Good to have you. Uh, on, a, on my left is the esteemed Dr. Christine Grant. Thank you so much for being here, Dr. Grant. Thank she, you. You're welcome. We are glad to have you. She is a full professor in chemistry and, let me get it right, biomolecular engineering and also an associate dean at North Carolina State University. She is also a fire starter who has written a book on success strategy, or I guess edited a book on success strategies for women in STEM. She works on biomedical systems and uh, interfacial phenomena. So thank you and welcome, Dr. Grant. Thank you. The topic of today's conversation and the flow of today's Vanguard episode is slightly different. For those of you who have been watching us all season, we've generally had a panel of three who talk about a specific issue, but our panelist, Nicole Cabrera, did something super incredible and started a really, really robust conversation on Twitter called Failing in STEM. And so, Nicole, I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about what Failing in STEM is uh, why, and why you created the hashtag. Sure. So um, I I made the hashtag one day because I was having the same sort of conversations in my life, um, and most notably um, because a really good friend of mine um, who's in um, a physics program, she took her qualifier exam and um, passed two out of the four and failed two out of the four. And she was feeling really down, and we were having this conversation about... Um, what it means to fail and and how how it made her feel and I was trying to you know encourage her um, and I realized that um, you know to sort of encourage her and, and say you know don't feel bad because I failed in this way and I started telling her stories about um, things that I had done and things that I had messed up along the way along you know either in my undergrad or graduate school and I realized that we had never really had those conversations and that we don't usually have conversations like that um, in STEM. I mean, I don't, I don't hear it from my advisor. I don't hear it from my peers. Um, you don't, you know, when you um, see a press release of um, a group that discovered something, you don't hear the ways that they failed. You only hear the success stories. And I think that this can be really damaging. And I think it can be especially damaging um, to groups that are underrepresented and marginalized in STEM. So, um, because when you um, when you're part of those groups and you fail, you tend to believe that it's something that there's something wrong with you, and not that it's just a natural part of of being a scientist. So I thought it was it was just sort of a way for me to vent about those things, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and it kind of surprised me by taking off, and and a lot of people contributed their stories of failure, um, and and so that that's how it got started. That's amazing. I, I love that it was so organic, that it was a conversation that you had that you were like, wait, this should be shared with the world. We should talk more about this. this is a really great thing to do, and hence the reason we love Twitter. Uh, speaking of Twitter, if you're watching and you want to interact with our, our panelists, please ha use the hashtag VanguardSTEM. That's where we'll be looking all night and live tweeting this, about the episode with all the fantastic gems of wisdom our panelists are going to give. So feel free to share with us, ask questions all through the night, because you're our third panelist 
you, esteemed viewer, are definitely <laughs> feel free to tweet at us at any time if you have any questions. So when you sent the the hashtag out to the universe, often what happens when we have things like that is, you know, we think of something and it's like, I'm just, I'm going to, I'm going to vent, right? I'm going to, I'm going to vent on Twitter about it. Were you expecting people to respond to you? And if you, and what happened when they did? So I wanted, I, I did want to have this conversation. I wanted other people to participate. Um, eventually, like I did, it didn't start off that way. And then I was like, Hey, wait a minute. I went on this rant. I like, I, I don't know, I tweeted like 20 things, um, and then I sort of reached out to people because I did want to hear, for even for just myself, to be comforted and to know that other people that I know, that I admire, also have these stories of failure. Um, and, and also mm -hmm. so that other people who are currently having failures, that they don't give up because of those failures, right? So um, one of the things that we know about, um, about women in particular, for example, and minorities, um, is that they sort of... Very, at very young ages, they're taking themselves out of the STEM race because um, they can't see themselves in those kinds of careers, mm -hmm. um, possibly because of failures in mathematics or in science classes. And so I kind of wanted to send the message to people out there who are struggling that it's, it's okay that we all struggle um, and that they can get through it and you know that people at every level have experienced some sort of fail failing story. Um, so I didn't think that... I, you know, <laughs> I didn't think it would get this big. I was hoping that people would participate, and I did reach out to um, some people and ask them, you know, um, what are your stories about feeling in STEM? Um, and ha happily, people people started picking it up and responding. Um, and then it got it it got picked up, I think, by BuzzFeed, and then people even more people started talking about it. It actually went on for a couple of days, and I really did not expect that. Yeah, so speaking of how it took off, let's just let's just state it out into the universe. It was picked it up, which is always a good thing. Uh, there's lots of conversation. Your university, Georgia State University, picked it up, and they also wrote an article about you. Um, and also it was published in sort of Nature Online, right? Yeah, so yeah. there was a lot of play. This idea of failure resonates with a lot of people. And, you know, it's interesting that you said you reached out to people because the narratives aren't out there. And I'll tell you, really, to be honest, that one of the reasons why I even wanted to have this conversation, um, and this will lead into a question that I have, is because it's not just that the narratives of failure aren't out there. It's that, as you alluded to, there's no room for certain groups to make, make, make mistakes, to have you know, have these so-called failures in their life. And so what I was wondering is if you noticed any trends in the in the people who responded to you, was it a wide demographic or, you know, did, did you get some representation from everyone? Was it certain groups? Tell me a little bit about who responded when you put out this call. So from what I saw, and I was following it a lot for the first day and then I kind of like got out of hand, um, I, I saw a lot of women responding. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that's just because, you know, there could be a lot of, factors involved, um, but I think it particularly resonated with women because um, because we tend to have like more like imposter syndrome and stuff like that and um, our, we are sort of also pushed out. Um, I don't know, like I don't have any demographic information so I can't, I can't tell if there were, was any particular group, but I definitely saw that women were responding a lot more <laughs> and, um, and there were some people who didn't really understand like what the hashtag was about. Um, like there was there was a guy who said, oh, this should be called humble bragging in STEM or something like that, right? People who, who just kind of like come in in the middle of a conversation and, and didn't really get it. But I think um, it really did resonate with women just because it's something that we have in the back of our minds all the time um, that maybe um, men in the field don't have to think about, right? It's invisible to them. Um, whereas for us, like any little failure is like it's right there at the forefront, right? I mean, you carry that around with you, um, and 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 even some people were confessing their own failures and saying, um, you know, I was always afraid of of telling the story because I thought it might prevent me from getting a job later on or something like that. I mean, really, really things that you would think, you know, aren't that big of a deal, but but people are so afraid of of confessing those things. So yeah, I was I was very. Um, moved by all those stories and uh, um, a lot of the ones that I saw were from women. Yeah, yeah, and actually that's a really good place. Uh, Christine, I want to grab you in here uh, as I'm going into this next question, but, but the thing that resonated with me about this, this notion is that 
we have to have wider narratives of who's doing this work, right? This is why, you know, I started right. this in the first place, right? This, you know, conversations with women of color in STEM. Mm -hmm. They wanted to showcase the fact that we're here, we exist, and that we have a wide expression, a wide experience. And, you know, it's okay to be both a woman of color in STEM and have a failure. Like, that's okay. So I wanted to talk a little bit about um, your book that you co-edited called Success Strategies for Women in STEM. Could you tell us a little bit about the book and what made you decide to write it. Okay, thank you so much and thank you for having me on this. This is my first Google Chat Hangout thing and I'm excited to be here. So actually the book is called Success Strategies from Women in STEM and it was written by myself, uh, it was co-edited by myself and Peggy Pritchard who is in Canada and actually Peggy wrote the first edition or edited the first edition back in 2006, so almost 10 years ago, and it, that one was called Success Strategies for Women in Science. And the interesting thing was there were several women that wrote chapters, and I wrote a chapter on mentoring in that one, in a chapter and mentoring in this one as well. But the thing that was really interesting was we found between the first edition and the second edition that there were men who were reading this book. And there were men who were buying it for their graduate students, for their faculty, for their wives, for their daughters. And so we thought, well, wait a minute. It's not just about success strategies for women in science. We expanded it to be in STEM, but also that it's from women. So the group of women who wrote the book include folks who are leaders at universities, researchers in industry and in academia. And it's just a whole host of folks in the different science uh, fields. And some of them were repeats from the first book and some of them were not. So we have chapters in there on um, mentoring and climbing the ladder, leadership, and let's see, negotiation, a, a whole lot of different subjects. And so the interesting paradigm shift for me is that these women who wrote the chapters are actually successful. And so it's success strategies from them to whoever. So it could be men or women. So that was the interesting uh, part of the book. And I wanted to pick up, if I could, on something that she said earlier. Uh, you know, when I started graduate school in 1984, there were no cell phones, there was no internet, and the only time you as a scientist got to go out and talk about what you did was when you went to conferences or if you published in a journal, right? And we don't publish failures in journals, and we don't go to conferences and talk about our failures because we want everyone to know that we're doing a really good job and the press releases that come out are on successes, not on failures. So I think that uh, this ability to have the internet and Google Hangout and chats and Twitter and all these things to really honestly talk about your feelings about what has happened to you, that is a really new concept. And I think that that's what you're seeing. And the people who are the professors, people like me are, are kind of in the middle of this but most of the more senior faculty who are on their way out, retiring and things like that, they are actually from that old school where you really only promoted the things that you did well, not the things that you were not so good at. So I, that just really struck me when she was talking, and especially when she talked about the qualifying exams. I went to Georgia Tech for my master's and PhD, and I didn't pass all my qualifying exams the first time. I didn't pass them all the second time. I guess I shouldn't be saying this in public, right? But but I didn't pass them all the second it's time right. either. Oh, it's so cathartic to be able to say this out loud. So right. I didn't pass them the first time or the second time. And in fact, I got my master's degree, and my advisor kept me on to, to write some papers and study for the PhD qualifier to pass that. I think it was one or two. Maybe it was one that I had left. So I waited like six months and took them again and studied, studied all through Christmas, didn't go home for Christmas, and I passed the last one. And it was a real big celebration. Well, after I got tenure, I found out that there were some senior faculty who were not women of color who also didn't pass their qualifying exams when they were in school, but they never talked about it. And one of them, I won't name any names, but one of them is actually in the National Academy of Engineering now. Right. So as a chemical engineer, I'm thinking, well, golly, people didn't talk about that. So it's really interesting to hear how it has shifted. And I believe that being able to talk about these things openly is, is key. And everything my colleague said is, is true about women and underrepresented minorities, this imposter syndrome, and, and all those things cause us to maybe uh, hide that even more or not really want to talk about it because people already... Some people, not all people, may already have a preconceived notion that we're going to fail anyway. So we don't want to feed into that by telling them that we have failed, when what we don't realize is that they've actually failed too. Right. But they're not going to tell you that because they have to present as though you know they've got it all together and right. 
that's because we're supposed to be so bright. So um, anyway, no, that's a really good point. It's a really good point, and and it's something that you know it's imp it's there's something that both of you hit on that I want to underscore here, which is the notion that when you make the situation better and more open for one set or one group, you actually just make it better for a lot of people, right? The yeah. truth is, is that if we were to actually lift up the you know curtain on the record <laughs> of the National right. Academies of Engineering, the National Academies of Science, Nobel Prize winners, they have not all been perfect no. all the oh, way through. You know, and, and the, it, the dangerous point is when we combine this notion of failure with, you know, sort of these sort of imposter syndromes, these stereotype threat kinds of things. But the thing that I want to point out, and both of you have talked about it, um, and it's, it's something that I saw in the, in the book, Christine, but also, you know, as we are talking to each other and encouraging other, each other, this has come out, that we want to get away from talking about failure as final, right? Failure oh, is not golly. final. Failure <laughs> is... It, it is a temporary state of affairs and you know yeah. many people who do sort of coaching and kind of you know moving uh, psychological processes forward talk about the growth mindset and the fact that you know if we take these things as being malleable and, and take yeah. them as being a current moment in time that we're going to take and, and, and make something great with then we can actually come out with better outcomes and Nicole this was something that was really powerful on your hashtag people weren't just saying I'm horrible at everything I'm a failure they were saying I took this class and I failed it and then I took it again and I passed it and now I'm getting my PhD right. or um, <laughs> actually he's not a woman of color in STEM but this one made me chuckle uh, when Chris Lintot said that he had you know independently discovered Earth's ozone layer you know like <laughs> These things happen, but you know, the idea that failure isn't final, that it right. doesn't mark you, that's not a scarlet letter, I think that is a really powerful thing. So I wonder, you know, what pieces of, what kinds of things did you use as you were negotiating failure to get you from the point where, you know, you didn't pass the quals to, okay, I'm going to study or I'm going to keep going, in, in your case, Christine, when you said that, you know, you just sort of studied all through Christmas, what made you go that extra step instead of saying, you know what, I can't do this? Um, and Nicole, talk to me a little bit about, you mentioned in your narratives about um, getting into graduate school and negotiating that whole process. So if each of you could just give me a you know, give me a few minutes worth of what allowed you to look at, at failure as being something to step forward on and not a final answer. Sure. Um, so I won't talk about the grad school thing. I'll actually talk about um, something else. But uh, in my first year of graduate school, um, and I guess I'll just briefly mention that um, I was applying to graduate schools um, the year that the stock market crashed in 2008 um, and I could only afford to apply to five schools so I applied to the top five. I had a really good um, dossier of undergrad ex uh, research experience and everything. I didn't get into any graduate schools so when I um, my, my undergrad advisor pushed for me to sort of late apply to Georgia State and they took me in, <laughs> thank God, because uh, I didn't know what else I would do, right? Um, and so that was sort of like, you know, I got in uh, very, very late and so it kind of felt like they just felt sorry for me maybe and they like took me in um, and then in my first year it was so so hard and um, I had not anticipated how difficult it would be and um, and the kind of stress that I would be under um, and I would call my mom and I would be like why am I here I'm quitting and she would say you know normal like mom things like oh you know you're so great and you're gonna be fine but um, and you know, I love my mom, and that and that was very encouraging. But at the same time, I kind of felt, well, mom, you don't really, do you really know? Like, you, you just believe in me because I'm your daughter, but um, you haven't been through this process, and so it was hard for me to hear that from her. Um, but luckily, I did have a really good friend who was a couple of years uh, older than me. Um, she was doing her physics PhD at Georgia Tech, um, just down the street, um, and she was telling me, you know, I would tell her, like, I want to quit, I want to get out of here, you know, I'm not made for this. And she would tell me, no, 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 like, I went through that same thing a couple of years ago, but look where I am now, you can do the same thing. You know, she said, it does, it, it is terrible, but you know what, you're not going to fail, you're going to be fine. And I could hear those words from her because she had been through that. And so having somebody that was a little bit farther down the line than me who understood where I was coming from and who was encouraging me to keep going, that was really one of the only reasons that I stayed. I would have quit my PhD in my first year if I had not had her, you know, supporting me. So um, 
what I did later on um, when I realized that that was the case um, is that I started um, a mentoring group in my department called AstroPal. I told you you were a starter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, because I, you know, I just thought, I don't want this to happen to another woman, another woman of color, if, you know, behind me, whoever, and, and my department is, is heavily um, white and male, especially in the higher ranks. Um, but I really didn't, I wanted women of color to, to sort of have the same experience as me. I didn't want them to, like, get there, feel like a failure, and maybe possibly not have somebody telling them, you know, you can, you can keep going. Um, and that's part of the reason that we have such, such a high attrition rate for women and women of color in STEM. Um, so I decided to start this mentoring program for women, right, with the idea that it would benefit women and women of color. Right. But it's a, it, like you said, Jedida, it's a group that really benefits everyone in the program because we um, allow everybody, all the new students, to come in um, and be mentored by a slightly senior graduate student. And um, and the idea is it helps everybody really, but mm -hmm. it's 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 quite for those uh, women who have less of a chance of of staying in the field and not just staying in graduate school, because my program has a pretty um, high you know most people graduate with their PhD who started off wanting the PhD. The problem is that um, a lot of women tend not to stay in the field, um, and so I wanted to have a way for women because even I I'm leaving research right, and so. Um, I wanted it to be different for other women after me. And so, um, like you said, it, it benefits everybody, but um, but the focus was really um, these minority groups. Right, right. I feel you. Christine, did you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, the interesting thing is when you first started talking about this, I thought, well, you know what? There really is a reason that they have two or three times for you to actually take your qualifying exams. Absolutely. It's because they don't expect you to pass them all in the first time, right? So uh, when, I was at, when I was at Georgia Tech, we had a group of women that got together. And it really is exciting to me, but it's also painful to me that we have uh, still, what is this now, 20, 25 years later, she's right down the street at Georgia State where I was at Georgia Tech, and she's having to start a group now, 20-something years after I was there. And there were groups around. And, and I think that, that often what happens is, uh, with mentoring, which is, uh, that's what I wrote the chapter on in the book, when, with mentoring, unless it's institutionalized or unless there's something that really is, um, oh, I don't know, part of the institution, sometimes those programs die off with the people who leave, right? So I'm glad, it sounds like what she's set up is something that is going to have a legacy. She's going to leave a legacy in the department that goes beyond mentoring underrepresented minority women or underrepresented minorities or women, right? So that's really important. So I think that the key thing is to have uh, what I wrote down here was a mentor or a champion or an advocate. In her case, what she was just describing is something that I call peer mentoring, right? So mentoring by your peers. And sometimes you don't think of it as, peer, as mentoring because you think of a mentor as someone who's much older than you or more senior. But a peer mentor is someone who's just gone through the steps that you went through and is able to mentor you. So that's really important. And then for myself, it was to have a champion or an advocate, somebody who really believed in me, who said, Christine, you can do this. We're going to help you. We want you to be in this PhD program, and at the time there had been, I guess, no African American women who had gotten a PhD out of Georgia Tech in chemical engineering. There might have been one before. Um, I think she was started in materials and finished in chemical engineering, but let's say there was just one, right? So for them, it was really important for me to finish, and they gave me the opportunity, and they believed in me. So that was something, because if you don't believe in yourself, then what's going to happen is when you get these negative messages, you're just going to take them in, and you're going to say, oh, yeah, of course. Of course, this is proof that I really am not very good. And so having a champion or an advocate is, is really important. And using your network. So networking is very important because, especially with the internet, and that's why this, this program that you're doing is so good because now it's not just somebody sitting in a classroom at Georgia Tech or at Brown or at Clemson. It's somebody who can get online and see this video after it's done. And, and let's say that I don't have the time to mentor somebody. I can say, oh, well, you need to go watch this video because there's information in there. So I think that the internet is really good. Uh, for helping with with that. No, it's true, and it's you know this this notion of a support system in all its varied forms is something that recurs on the show because one of the things that happens for women of color in STEM in particular is that we often persist longer than our, our male colleagues or men of color because mm -hmm. we have a different set of biases that are levied right. against us. 
Uh, and so for, for reasons that are not just and not fair, we do tend to persist further than our male colleagues. But the, the, the payout for that or the, the sort of tax for that is that we're often feeling isolated in our spaces because, as you say, we're generally the only one in our field, the first one in our field, right. you know, the, 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 one, the first one in 20 years, you know, oh, we don't know, maybe this one, we aren't, we aren't sure, right? And those things engender a sense of loneliness, and it's sort of a, like a Don't feel like you ever belong. We, we don't feel like we belong, and so this notion of a support system is key. And and I like what you said, Christine, about the different types of support, right? And mm -hmm. and Nicole, going back to the mother, I I cried every day for the first three years of my graduate program. I cried every day, and every day, like clockwork, I would call my mother, who was my first, you know, support system. I'd call her and I'd cry, just like you know you were talking about. And I would tell her how I was going to quit the program, and she would let me cry and cry and cry. And when I got finished crying, she'd be like, but you can't quit, right? <laughs> you know, it was just sort of like, that's great. I'm glad that you got that out, but you got to keep going, you know. Um, so that was the first one. But then, as you say, Christine, there is the notion of needing, you know, mentors you about, like, what the process is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we often talk about, you know, mentors and advocates and, and champions. Well, mentors, really. Let's, let's stick with mentors for right. We, we often talk about mentors for like the really good things. They show you how to, you know, get the key. They show you, you know, which direction to go. But mm -hmm. actually having a mentor that you can talk through your failures with yes. and work through those failures and come up with solutions is a critical component of success such that when you get to a place that you need an advocate or a champion, you have gotten to those places. Um, so I think, you know, this, this idea of not just mentoring, not just support systems, which we talk about a lot and often quite generically, but beyond that to say that you've got to have systems in place, people in place that you can talk about these things through. And I think, Nicole, going back to something you said, it actually does have to be well-rounded, right? Like it can't right. just be home because then you feel like, well, they don't understand. And right. it can't just be school because then you feel like, well, they don't really understand, right? Like your whole person is built up into sort of the the, the, the liminal space, y'all who have heard me talk about this, I love that word, the liminal space between those identities. And so I really like that, um, that, 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 that structuring of it in the context of failing in STEM and, uh, and realizing that everybody does it. And then if we're honest, if the people around us were honest, everybody has failed at something, we will fail again. Like failure, if we aren't just coming into it, we're getting out of it or, you know, about to go into it again, right? Like that's just the way... The way failure works, but it's so, not final, and we can keep going. Yeah, Christine. Well, I was going to say that you know it's really important that you have the right people talking to you and giving you advice, because while I want everybody, every woman of color, to get a master's degree or a PhD, that's what I want, right? I want everybody to finish. Let's just be honest. This field and what we're doing and how we're doing it is not going to be the same pathway for everyone. And I would personally rather have someone change their their discipline from chemical engineering and go into material science, get your master's in chemical engineering and get your PhD in material science if it's not a fit. So you also have to be careful what voices you're listening to and who's telling you what because it might not be, you know, you have an advisor and you're not getting along with your advisor, it might be that there is not a fit and you need to find another advisor or you need to find another project. And so it's not just hang in there, you can do it, add a girl, you know, it's it's stick in there no matter what. Sometimes you need to make sure that you have the people who know you well enough to be able to advise you. I remember when I first started as a graduate student, you were thinking you were talking about quitting. Back in the day, my boyfriend, now husband, we're getting ready to celebrate 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> but back in the day, he knew me. He knew me from undergrad, and he. I basically told him when I went to to Georgia Tech. I said, I want to quit. I was ready to quit. I've never said this publicly either. I want to quit because I am not helping my people. And he said, what are you talking about? And I said, you know, I was involved with the National Society of Black Engineers, and, and I was real active, and now all I'm doing is going to class and being in the lab. I said, I'm not helping my people. This is not helping the movement. And he said, the movement? What are you talking about? And so finally he had to say, look, you know, just Go back. I understand your frustration, but you've got to stick it out, and then you'll be able to help people more and better later. But, you know, if it was somebody else, he might have said, yeah, you know, you're right. This is really not, this is not a good fit for you. You need to go out and help the movement, and then you can come back to school later. But he knew me well enough to know that that's where I needed to be. So you have to be careful who you're listening to as well. That's absolutely true. So there, a question came in from Plants I Richie, Plants I See Richie. Thanks, 
Thanks so much. Uh, and she wants to know, and this goes back to something you said, Nicole, um, and, and I think it's a really good point, so thank you for bringing it up. But she says, why does failing versus succeeding, especially given that many people know when they enter the field that they're probably going to want a non-traditional trajectory. Uh, so, you know, how do we help make that be okay is the question. Uh, I'll, let you, I'll let you two take a shot, and then I, I actually have something I want to say to you. So, sure. Great question. You. Um, I actually think that um, it shouldn't be a failure. I absolutely. If um, so, I I agree with Christine. I, I I want everybody to get like a higher degree <laughs> in science, just because I think that um, as a society we would be better informed voters if we knew more about science and how it worked and how it gets funded and how it gets done and everything. Um, but I know that not everybody is going to go out there and get a job. Just in astronomy, for example, I think that um, right now there's only one tenure track faculty position for every four PhDs that are produced. Wow. And I think that's actually a conservative number. I think it's actually worse than that. So um, it's it's definitely detrimental for us to be telling people like um, you know, if you're in graduate school and you don't want to be a researcher, you shouldn't be here. That is completely first of all wrong because not everybody's going to be able to get those jobs. I mean the odds are against you, right? But also because um, there's so many other things that you can do and you can be so successful doing other things and science needs policy makers who are out there you know making sure that we get the funding that we need as researchers you need um, people doing science advocacy science communication and I think those are very successful careers so I really wish that we would stop telling people that if they're not going into research that they're somehow failing now for me um, I I don't consider myself a failure because I'm leaving research but I do think that there are factors involved um, when I came in as a first year graduate student the only thing that I wanted to do with my life is to be a researcher, be a professor and five years later I no longer want to do that. I really think that that passion that I had um, was chipped away at in the environment that I was in um, because being a woman of color you have a different experience coming in and I see my colleagues who came in wanting to be research professors and now they still want to be research professors and I have to question what is so different about me that I changed my mind. I really don't think that that's something that has to do with like oh I just don't like it, I didn't like research. I loved research before and it was the only thing that I wanted to do and you know you add all of those literal experiences, those negative experiences and it's no wonder that people you know want to change careers and I think that in that case um, it's a tragedy because we should not um, we should not be um, you know creating environments where people like me are going to um, have to be pushed out of what they dreamt of doing right and I think I'm lucky that I have other passions and that I want to communicate science and I want to do um, you know science advocacy and outreach um, I'm lucky that I have other passions that will that will make me happy, that, and I'm and I'm totally fine leaving research. But there are a lot of people out there that that's all they want to do, um, and they get pushed out, and they do feel like they failed because what are they going to do now? Do you know what I mean? So, um, I think that we need to change the environments to make it more amenable for people of color um, and other and other minorities to come in and say, you know, I want to do this, and and we should. Uh, support them so that they continue wanting to do that. Um, but I also think that having um, a malleable career path is absolutely important. You have to come in, even if your number one thing is to be a researcher, to have a backup plan because, like I said, the math does not add up. Even if you really, really want it, even if you're the top person in your field, um, the you know jobs are not looking really good right now if you want to be a tenure track professor. So you just have to open up your options, right? Um, and I just think that um, that we really need to be telling people that. So hopefully that answers your question. So yeah, just, let me just jump in here really quickly and say, you know, the, your your points about you know like not allowing it to be a failure. A failure. I think we should underline that there is a difference between a personal failure and an institutional failure, right? Like, and I think what you're speaking to is that you don't personally feel like you're failing because you're doing something different, but there is something in the system that has failed you and soured you to that point. So I'm going to put a flag there. I want to come back to that. But I needed to say it, Chris, okay. Christine. It's all you. Yes. Yeah, so this is really interesting, and uh, maybe I'll get in trouble, but you know I'm not shy. So. The academy is a very elitist place. Uh, it, it's very elitist. I mean, we are the top of the top, the creme de la creme. You know, we're all trying to 
move our institutions forward. We're trying to get our rankings up. We're trying to move, you know, we're competing with people from around the country for top research dollars. I mean, it is a very intense place. And a lot of us, a lot of our colleagues want to have uh, many me's, right? They want to have people who do the same thing as they do and get out there and produce and their, their legacy. You know, you've seen those um, scientific family trees where some people can trace their lineage back to Einstein and then or further back, you know, to Galileo and they just they make these trees and, and this is something, this is a culture, it's, a, it's part of the culture of the academy. I think that the most important thing is, hmm, I maybe shouldn't say this, but make your advisor think that that's all you want to do is research when you're in the academy because that's what they need. So when you're in there for that five year or three year or six year or whatever period, do whatever it need, you need to do to generate your research, to write your papers, to um, do whatever you have to do to meet the needs because you know your advisor, it's a it's a um, it's a partnership, right? You your advisor supplies you with the funding, most likely, and the support, and you are the person who is is doing the science, uh, and you work collaboratively to generate products in publications and things like that. So when you're in the academy, it's really important to do that. However, as you get towards the end, uh, you can start to explore different things, and I will tell you that. Back in the day, scientists were just in these ivory towers in the academy and in companies. I mean, when I worked at Procter and Gamble, they had a uh, research division, and and they probably still do. But a lot of companies now no longer have the long-term uh, research. Um, they call them country clubs that they used to have because now they're doing more applied and, and different types of research. So the whole landscape has changed, and so what is needed out there. Uh, are people who can do science policy like she mentioned because guess what the reason why Congress and some of the other folks are not giving funding is because they don't understand the science you need people right. who are going to be scientists who are going to be in Congress who are going to be I don't know if lobbyists is a good word or not but you know you need people out there who are going to advocate for science and the and the field of, of the fields associated with STEM beyond just the folks who are in the institutions in the Academy and I think People who are broad-minded will eventually, unfortunately not quite yet, but they will eventually embrace that their students are going to do a lot of different things that long-term will actually help them even more. So anyway. right. I think, I think you've made some good points. There's some things that I want to come back to uh, in, in both of what you said. So let me just start with uh, what you just said, Christine, just since it's fresh on the top of my head. I think there is a tension between what the expectations are. So I take your point about you know, um, advisors and how important they are and how, you know, that process needs to be collaborative. And I think you're right there. I think where I would probably suggest a different approach is, for example, um, in the choice of advisor, right? So if yes. someone who is doing something that's, you know, definitely what you want to do and you find it scientifically interesting, but you see that they are closed-minded to careers outside of academia, then even if their science is interesting, they may not be the best match for you because they're not going to be able to help you along to what you want to do. Because I think it's important to recognize that each person has agency. And even though the advisor always has the power, each person has agency. And so I don't want to, I don't want to say that, you know, a student needs to just, you know, like, bear up under it no matter what. I think that, you know, before we make the commitment to an advisor, you know, that's our greatest power, that's our greatest power place. We want to be careful with who we're choosing. And some of the ways that one can do that is, you know, to ask the advisor, you know, so how many of your students have gone into insert thing that you're interested in, right? Because it's not always the tension between academia and industry. Sometimes it's, you know, the amount of, as, you know, Nicole was talking about, the amount of social engagement or social justice advocacy or things. So it's whatever you're interested in that is not along the traditional path that might be worth discussing. Um, so I think that's really where the critical moment is, especially if one goes into the field knowing that they're not going to want to do this non-traditional path. And so, you know, I think that choice of advisor and negotiating what the priorities are going to be in that relationship before one gets farther down the line is probably um, the optimal situation. 
Now that doesn't solve the problem for people who are in programs and, and like Nicole, career, <laughs> right? Like if you've already made the decision, you can't right. you can drop them. But generally, right. you don't want to take that hit because if you want to get out and do something different, you don't want to stay any longer. So that's not a, that's not by any means a panacea. But I think you know since we're talking both to young women of color or we're, we're really talking to everyone, but we're focusing in on women of color um, who are sort of coming through the process. Then the really the key piece of power you have is in, in your choice. And so don't don't give that choice up why um, uh, loosely. Uh, so then, Nicole, I wanted to go back to your that point about the personal failure versus the institutional failure. And and your, I, I love that you brought in the statistics, good scientist that you are, uh, because you know I heard one of my good friends say it this way, and I've never forgotten it. She said, you know, we talk about uh, non-traditional or or alternate career paths in academia, and that always means outside of the ivory tower, for lack of a better word. But according to the numbers. Actually, being inside the ivory tower is the alternate career, right? Like that's the career that, like, you may or may not get, and you know, other, the, the, you know, so certain people only do that, right? Like that's the the space that that happens, in. and that's been a really freeing thing for me, uh, because, and again, this is why this conversation about failing and spam and success strategies resonated with me because what we're trying to do is expand the narrative. We're trying to create a wider place for more people to be involved such that when we're there, you just can't leave the culture the way it is. It's just not going to work because there are so many people that need so many different things. But I do recognize, Christine, you are absolutely right, that there is a tension between that and sort of winning grants and doing whatever. And I think that as we, on both sides, make our opinions work heard and, and work towards uh, um, uh, a solution that that's where the, the real interesting innovation is going to be. And, and to be honest, I'll, I'll just make a, a pretty bold prediction. I think that the, the institutions that are willing to take a gamble on this right now and try it, like mm -hmm. bring on people like Nicole, uh, who are very tech savvy, who are, you know, very good at communicating science and bring them on as like lauded members of the community and maybe use them as bridges between, you know, the, the, whatever science is from astronomy in this case and you know communications and, and all these things I think those are the schools that are really going to take us uh, over the edge in terms of like really interesting new things so let me just pause here and say to our audience thank you so much for watching uh, we are open for your questions we'd love to hear them if you have questions for um, Nicole about her hashtag what she learned from it uh, or Christine about her book and about the mentoring I Christine went and looked at the chapter on dealing with failures because no book on success strategies would be complete without yeah. talking about failures and I like how a lot of the strategies that, that you all talked about are things that Nicole brought up and are, and are things that we have advocated here on this show before, right? Um, one of the things I like to advise people about is creating distance between you and a situation so that what happens in that situation isn't related to, to you. It's not a part of your character um, or who you are. So um, I, I, I'm, I'm interested in hearing Nicole, since you're in the situation with your with an advisor right now, um, and by that I just mean you have an advisor, not that you're in a particular situation. <laughs> but um, talk to me about how, if you're comfortable, if you're not, don't worry about it. We can definitely move on. But talk to me if you're comfortable about how you've negotiated this transition from wanting to do science as your primary career to wanting to do some more advocacy, social justice things. Sure. Um, it was actually pretty easy. I just sat down with my advisor. It, it was very um, nerve-wracking, of course, and it took me weeks to get up the nerve to say, I don't want to do research anymore because that was the path that I was going on. Mm -hmm. um, and then <laughs> he couldn't, He, you know, he said, okay, you know, I kind of saw this coming, um, and he was supportive, but he said, you know, I don't really know what to do tell you and I don't know how to advise you because I don't know, I only know how to become a researcher, you know, I don't know how to become um, a science communicator, for example, and so I had to find my own mentors and I think that this is something that's really important for everybody to do, especially for women of color, because when you go into your um, graduate institution, chances are you're going to be the only one there um, and you're not going to be surrounded by other women like you who whom you can project yourself into a career later on. So I think it's super important to sort of find your own mentors. Um, and that's what I did. I, you know, I went to um, my uh, university has a career center, and they offer one-on-one -on -one career counseling. And it's free, which is amazing. Um, and they do it um, up to a year after you graduate. So I can, you know, even once I graduate, I can still go see my career counselor. 
and she has been really amazing um, in helping me transition because I walked into her office and I said, I don't want to do research anymore. I'm certain of that. Here's what I'm passionate about. Are there jobs out there that I can do? Because I had no idea, you know. And she said, um, you know, I'm not sure she's a career expert, but she'd never had a PhD student before. You know, she get, mostly gets undergrads who, um, who don't know what major they want to be. Um, and she, you know, she'd never worked with a science student before. So she said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach myself um, some things. And she came back to me, and, and we've been working to, together for about a year. And she's helped even simple things like converting my academic CV that has all my publications on it and all these things that, uh, people in the industry won't care about transitioning that into a resume that's relevant for whatever job I'm applying to, for example. Um, also recognizing that because I was scared, you know, I'm leaving academia. What am I going to do? There's nothing. No one's going to hire an astronomy PhD. I should have gotten a physics PhD because then at least I'd have lab experience, you know. Um, but just realizing um, how many companies in my city um, hire. PhDs in astronomy. Essentially, the you know the unemployment rate is zero percent. You will have a job. Will that job be necessarily in science? Maybe not. But um, there are just so many options out there, and it was super crucial for me to um, navigate the career world. I, I you know I had no idea how to network, how to um, approach people, how to do um, interventional interviews, how to get mentors in my field, in the field that I wanted to go into. So that was I, I really can't recommend that enough, uh, especially. Um, even if uh, for people who are just coming into grad school and aren't sure um, that they want to do anything besides research, it's something that's really important um, and it's helped me a lot, actually. So, can I say something? Oh, yeah. God. Okay. <laughs> so, the interesting thing, you know, I was thinking about the, the last comment um, that uh, you made about, um, about kind of staying the path and, and figuring it out until you get to where you can do something different. And uh, one of the things that happened uh, to me is that when I was a faculty member, I knew that I wanted to be in a leadership role. And I also knew that I wanted to do something having to do with women in STEM and underrepresented minorities and faculty development and things like that. And I knew I wanted to be in a leadership position, but I knew I didn't want to be a department head necessarily and go that route. And so I decided I wanted to be some type of leader and I remember somebody telling me well you need to get the full professor before you can be a leader in the, the ways that you want to be a leader, a respected leader who is uh, really making a difference and um, helping to make policy and, and decisions and things like that and one of the things I found was that in order to get to full professor I really had to put my um, my head down and just really burrow through it and finish it up. So it, it, at some point it didn't make a difference whether I wanted to do it or not or whether I wanted to be full professor or not. I knew that that was something that I was going to do in order to get to the next level. So going back to, to get to the next level and do the creative things that I wanted to do. So going back to the comments that were made earlier about um, kind of putting your head down and um, you know just burrowing through your, your PhD, I agree. With Jadida, that that you need to um, uh, pick your advisor well to begin with. But if in the middle, like Nicole found, you'd like to do something else, you need to explore that information with your advisor. And if they are supportive, that's great. If they are able to give you or point you in the direction of some other potential mentors, that's also great. But if they are not and you are close to finishing, then you need to just, like I said, put your head down and, and get it done because what happens is the PhD or the master's or whatever, bachelor's, whatever you're getting is a credential that is going to allow you to do other things. And so once you understand that, then some, some of that pain that you may experience, um, hopefully for just a short period of time, and I'm not an advocate of painful experiences, but some of the discomfort, um, if you talk to anybody who's finishing up their degree, whether they're a woman of color or not, uh, they all experienced some discomfort towards the end, especially when they were finishing up. And they had to negotiate with their advisor. Am I finished or am I not? Am I finished or am I not? And so that was uh, something that was, that was really important to me. So now that I've gotten through to full professor, now I can do the things I want to do and be more creative. And my path is very non-traditional in terms of uh, being a full professor. Um, so, Yeah, and I, you know, I think that there's... 
there is something to be said about, you know, the fact that, and I think this is a part of failing STEM, that mm -hmm. it is not always, the process is not always enjoyable, but that doesn't, no. that doesn't mean it's not worthwhile. And I think that, that that's true for any person along any dimension. You know, the, the reason we're talking about, you know, failing STEM in these terms is to sort of remove the taboo about failure. Right. But, but that, that doesn't mean that, you know, everything is always going to, even once we recognize that failure is not final, it's not always going to be a smooth path, right? And and that's yeah. no matter what. And, you know, one of the things that I wanted to sort of underscore here is something um, Nicole said, and it goes back to what you were just saying about, you know, like putting your head down and thinking, is part of the time we don't, we undervalue the skills that we have. So, Nicole, when you went out and decided that you were going to find yourself basically a recruitment team, you basically built a headhunting organization for yourself, like, that is an incredible skill to have, right? Like, that is not something that is um, to be, uh, what is the word, to, to be overlooked. And I think often we don't have as much exposure or practice at saying, this is what I'm good at. This is what I did. I built this thing. I am a starter. <laughs> you know, like, this is what you do. And, 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 and that can sometimes lead to feeling like we're not being as, as successful as we think we want to be because we don't know how to value the things that we have. Um, so I think that there is um, some space in there to think about how we um, can be honest and realistic. This is something that was in the book, Christine. Be honest and realistic about our skills, about the things that we're doing, about uh, the work that we're doing, and it's true import. Uh, and helping that sort of bolster our confidence going forward. There was another piece in the book that I really liked, and it said uh, to ride the wave of emotion. Mm -hmm. I thought that was mm -hmm. great. Yeah. Line, I think right? that was that was uh, written by my colleague Peggy Pritchard. Yeah. Yes, I, I, I think that was the chapter developing mental toughness. Yes. Right? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I thought that was fantastic. This idea that you know we are human. This, this is the story mm -hmm. we're trying to tell. Like yes. we are human. We are people, and we have thoughts and emotions and it doesn't matter if we've chosen science as our career, we still have those thoughts and emotions, we are still human beings. Uh, and so there are going to be emotions uh, go along with it. And this, I, I want to make sure that we underline this, especially mm -hmm. for young women that are coming through the process, that none of us are perfect, none of us are really expected to be perfect. People who place that expectation on you are being disingenuous completely disingenuous all the way through. Uh, you are successful as you make your way and you're learning. And so give yourself space and time for that. And then as you think about it, then you'll realize that sometimes you failed and, and it didn't go well and, you know, you kept going and it was great. You know, one of my favorite, I guess not, favorite is not the right word, but one of my stories about failure, and I've had many, uh, is when I first got out of undergrad, and Christine, go along with your point, I don't think I've actually <laughs> Uh, so when I first got out of undergrad, I, I did my undergrad in physics, I uh, got my bachelor's in physics, and then, and I got that at Norfolk State, the whole, <laughs> and when I got out, I had some life events come up that, like, made it hard for me to keep going, even though I knew I wanted a PhD in, in astrophysics or in astronomy, and so they had a program there that could give you a master's in material science, so I decided I would try it, <laughs> some school is better than no school. <laughs> but one of the things that is, you know, a key point is that I did not like chemistry. It was just not my subject. I was not into it. I could, it was just not my thing. Uh, and material science turned out to be a lot of chemistry, <laughs> a lot of very high level chemistry. And so I remember being in the class like, I don't know. I just don't know. And there's no, there's not no way I can learn, but I have no interest in learning polymer chemistry. Mm -hmm. No disrespect to those who do it. <laughs> Um, and so, so what happened was I just had this moment with myself where I was like, okay, I think I need to leave this program, which was new for me because, I, you know, I am an achiever. I'm an overachiever. I like to achieve things really well. And so the notion that I would leave uh, was disorienting to me. Um, and then it, it was also very scary because it felt like I was going to be pulled away from the trajectory that I was trying to go on. And, and so that was all very scary, but ultimately I did have to leave the program, and it was scary and it was hard, but then it, it really reaffirmed for me that I wanted a PhD in astrophysics, and that's what I wanted to do. Um, and so now here I am on the other side of that. It took me many, many years, going back to your point, Christine, about like putting your head down and doing it. Yeah. <laughs> 
many more failures, but I made right. it. So right. you know, I want to be careful to, to leave this conversation in a balanced way. Right, and right. We are talking about failing in STEM not as a way to put you off. We want as many of you to pursue STEM and pursue yeah. these degrees and these PhDs or whatever it is you want to do and your ultimate goals as, as possible. We want to make space for you. We want to give you examples of women who have done it. Uh, who are doing it, who are going through it, and all those things. But we we want you to know that like you will be okay, not in the as you as not in the the way that you said it, Christine. Not in the you'll be okay because it has to be okay. Right. Support <laughs> that there is a network and that we are here. Um, we are here behind you. So I've got a couple thoughts to close us out. Uh, that was one of them. <laughs> Um, but I want to, and by way of housekeeping, I wanted to point out that our last episode of the season is coming up in November. It's November 3rd at 7 p.m. Eastern. It'll be a season recap. We'll talk about um, all the episodes that we've had from beginning to transition to failing in STEM to finding our way. We're going to do a mashup of all those ideas. Uh, I'll be there um, guiding you through that. And it'll also be an opportunity to ask questions. I've gotten a lot of emails from young women in STEM that have wanted to know about you know, how I did it, how, how the women feature on the show did it. So I'll be there to answer those questions and offer some advice about my personal experience. So if you've had those questions and you want them answered publicly, feel free to join us. It's November 3rd. It'll be a series recap and, and ask me almost anything. So mark your calendar. <laughs> join us. Yes, I'm, I am putting an asterisk by that. <laughs> well, I have to tell you that this is really exciting because when I was at Georgia Tech, you know, we would go to the, to the dessert shop, the black women, and we would talk about what we were doing, and we would talk about our failures, and we would cry, and say, but then we would go back and kind of suck it up, and we would go back and do what we had to do. We didn't have this forum, and I just want to celebrate um, the next generation, I'll call you all the next generation, of folks that are, that are doing this because you're talking about it, and you're talking about it honestly and openly, and you're supporting each other, and that is so important. That is just so important, and so I'm, I'm excited. Oh, thank you so much. I, I am excited to be a part of it, and I can tell you this is far from the last you'll hear from Nicole because she is <laughs> <laughs> so glad to know her. Um, let's see. Our, just by way for our audience, our two panelists, Nicole and Christine, who have been incredible to us, so thank you for um, stopping by and hanging out with us and being honest and talking about Family STEM. Thank you, Nicole, for starting that very important conversation mm -hmm. on Twitter. I'm hoping that more women of color in STEM will feel the freedom and safety to share their stories of failure, uh, to be uplifted and encouraged. Thank you to Dr. Christine Grant. Oh, and good luck on finishing your dissertation, Nicole. Yes. <laughs> Dr. Nicole, we'll call her. That's right. Dr. Nicole, <laughs> there you are. There you are. Super proud of you, and thank you, Dr. Christine Grant, for writing and editing and, and taking on the mantle of, of codifying and writing out these success strategies. That's a really important thing. Thank you for using you. women as your sort of canvas to paint this story. Uh, we're very happy to have you both on the show. Thanks. Both of our panelists have agreed to come to our Facebook group, which if you just search mm -hmm. Vanguard Conversations with Women of Color in STEM, you'll find um, them there. They are, have been, they have agreed that they would come and be a part of the conversation for the next two weeks. So if there are questions we didn't get to here, please feel free to come visit us over there uh, to, to continue this conversation. Uh, so let me join me again in thanking, I guess you can't clap with me, but I'll clap for you again. <laughs> um, and I would personally like to thank Lana Hunter for helping me put the show together. She's the one that does a lot of work behind the scenes to make this happen, so thank you, Lana. Uh, I'd like to thank Mark Hunter for putting together the flyer for this particular episode and for Jasmine Johnson for the creative design. Uh, this is certainly a group effort. I couldn't do it without you. Um, I am thankful for the women of color and STEM that I've had in my life and also the larger support system that has supported me along the way. Uh, so with that, we'll see you next time. Thank you for joining us. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.